Good evening, everybody, and I want to give you a very warm welcome to this year's launch of the Warm Welcome campaign. It's great to be here, and I think there's over 500, nearly 600 people joining us this evening, which is absolutely tremendous. So we've got a great programme for you this evening. Um, we're going to be doing a little bit of looking back, but chiefly looking forward to find out what's new for this year and how you can make best use of being part of the Warm Welcome campaign network. And we've also got some really great speakers. We're going to hear from um, a very long time, high profile supporter of the campaign, some of the campaign partners. We'll hear from two people who are on the front line delivering warm welcome spaces in different parts of the country. And we'll also have a chance to put your questions to the expert panel from the warm welcome team. So we've got everyone on mute because it's such a big event, but we don't want um, to squish chat. So please do make full use of the chat boxes on the screen so you can connect with each other and share ideas. And also please stop posting your questions in the, Q in the question box um, because we'll be drawing on those questions when we get to the panel session. So um, my name's Isabel, I'm the Chief Exec of Libraries Connected. We're the organisation for public libraries across the country. And I'm really proud that we've been a partner of Warm Welcome since it started and that about a quarter of the spaces are delivered by libraries. And over the past couple of years, it's just been incredible how the movement's grown, um, not just more spaces, but in different locations and different types of spaces. And I think it's just incredible that out of nothing, nobody's got any money nobody's got any time but there's something that really special that's happened in the way that everyone's come together shared their experience shared their expertise shared their ideas and um, you know created something really wonderful that's doing an enormous amount to help people through loneliness and through the cold dark winter that we're, we're on the edge of now so i want to introduce our um, first uh, speaker who's an amazing person someone who has got an incredible mix of being incredibly gentle and incredibly forceful in equal measure. And that's David Barclay, who is the Warm Welcome Campaign Director and absolutely the driving force behind uh, forming this incredible movement. So- Hi, Isabel. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for joining us. It's brilliant to have so many people with us this evening. And it's, it's amazing to think about how far Warm Welcome has come in just two years since we first launched, what started very much as a, a crisis response during the energy crisis has turned into an extraordinary movement of more than 4,000 spaces of all kinds all across the country, as well as a growing network of partner organizations that are looking to support and get behind those local groups. And the exciting news is that word is really spreading about Warm Welcome and about the work that you're all involved in. I had the, the honour just a couple of weeks ago of accepting a third sector award on behalf of Warm Welcome in the breakthrough of the year category, which for me is a real sign that people are recognising the incredible impact and power of local community groups and community spaces. And then noticing as well the power of when we all come together and share resources and share learning to make ourselves more than the sum of our parts. So it feels like a great moment to be launching. Oh dear, sorry. <clears throat> Our um, smoke alarm's gone off. Must be someone down in the kitchen giving the evening rather too warm a welcome. <laughs> um, so David, I'll just qu quickly ask you. Um, so two years in, um, we've learned a lot. And uh, can you also outline what's new for this year? Absolutely. Yeah, thanks, Isabel. So one of the key bits of learning over the last uh, couple of years has been that people might well come for the warmth, but they really stay for the welcome. Um, now, sadly, we know that this winter there are going to be lots of people that will need a warm space because of the physical warmth, because they'll be struggling to keep themselves and their families uh, warm at home. Um, but we know too, and we've learned over the last two years, that warm welcome spaces have a much wider impact in terms of connecting people, in terms of providing a space of belonging and friendship for all different kinds of people. And we've seen as well that many of the spaces that really lean into that social aspect of what they're doing can actually be the best at tackling the potential stigma that might come from people who need to use the spaces due to experiences of poverty. In terms of what's new for this year, we've got a number of exciting new things. We've got some new partnerships 
that are going to unlock different kinds of resources for local spaces. And you're going to meet some of those partners a bit later on. We've got a whole suite of updated resources for this winter. So when you register on our website, you get access to our warm welcome handbook, but also all of our uh, brand toolkits and other ways that you can develop your space and talk about what you're doing. And then finally, we have a big new idea in the campaign, which is the warm welcome for all 100% pledge. And we'll be talking a bit more about that later on. But essentially, it's the idea that actually by working together, we have the opportunity to make sure that every person in this country has access to a warm welcome. That's great. That's such a, an incredible ambition and uh, yeah, really exciting to be uh, sort of launching that today. Um, so, you know, it's a big movement now. Last year, over 4,000 spaces, two, 2 million, 2 million people or 2 million visits to warm welcome spaces, big numbers. So hopefully, all the places that have joined um, over the last two years want to join up again. But obviously, as you just said, we want to welcome more and more spaces. So what are your top tips, David, for spaces, like the new ones or old ones? I think my first top tip is that it's all about people. Um, so starting off by thinking about who are the people that you would most love to be using your space. Um, and what might attract them? What might they find useful or attractive? What's going to really entice them to come in and be part of what you're doing? But also, who are your people? Who's your team that you're going to work with uh, to run the space in terms of staff or in terms of volunteers? And how are uh, things going to work for them? How are we going to make sure that the warm welcome space is something that they're really proud to belong to and be part of? The second top tip is to really explore uh, what's going on around you. So you can use our warm welcome map on our website and see what are the other registered spaces in your area. You could even go and visit one of the other spaces, see what they're doing, talk to them, see what's worked well, see what they've been struggling with and think about what might complement the existing provision in your area and which organisations could you partner with locally uh, who might provide different kinds of resource, whether that's food or volunteers or whatever it might be to make or to develop your space. So whether you've been running for a long time or whether you're just getting started, thinking about the people, exploring what's around you. And then of course, there's lots of practicalities and logistics. And the key top tip there is register with us on the Warm Welcome website. Even if you haven't decided exactly what you're gonna do, even if you don't know when it's gonna be open, you can register with us. That will give you access to all of the resources. And then when you're ready, you can put yourself live on our warm welcome map so that people can find you. That's great. So I think we, we just want to really emphasize this evening, please, please do register. Um, spread the word. Anyone you know in your area running one of these spaces, do please encourage them to register too, because um, you know, as you were saying, David, that's that's registering gives you access to resources. So do you want to say a little bit more about about that? Yeah, of course. So reg first thing to say is that registering is really simple and it's free. Um, but the main thing is it will benefit your space. How will it benefit your space? Well, we keep an up to date list of funding opportunities, specifically thinking about warm welcome spaces and what might be easiest to access and most useful for your space. So you can find that list on our website when you register, but you'll also get our regular newsletters, which will give you access to, you'll be the first to hear about new opportunities. We've also, as I mentioned before, got a whole bunch of resources and branding, so you can uh, make the most of that in terms of how you're communicating about your space. You can go up on our map, and we have lots of people looking at our map, particularly through the winter, and actually, increasingly, we have different kinds of partner organizations who are looking to signpost people um, by using our map, whether that's GPs, other public services, uh, uh, charity partners, business partners. Um, they all want to send people towards our map. So being on there is really useful. You might even get some volunteers uh, coming and wanting to get involved through being on our map. Um, but the other aspect of this is the collective aspect. Yes, we really hope it will be beneficial for you and your space. But every time a space joins uh, Warm Welcome, it strengthens the whole movement. It makes it easier for us nationally to build exciting partnerships, to tell the story of what these spaces are doing. Uh, and it builds our collective voice, our collective power 
if we want to change some of the underlying problems and issues that we might be seeing in our communities. Thanks, that's brilliant. Yeah, and I think it is this sense of, you know, it's not just a network, it does feel like a movement, it does feel like a community in a way that even the, even the smallest space is part of this enormous, great, big, wonderful response that's happening, which is great. So thank you, David, that's, that's uh, really great to hear all that and exciting to be looking ahead as well. Um, so now we have a short film from someone who's been a very staunch supporter of the Warm Welcome movement since the beginning. I want to express my thanks to every Warm Welcome space for the contribution you offer, the service you give and the difference you make. But from small beginnings two years ago, Warm Welcome has already become one of the most successful community initiatives. Supporting four and a half million visits in 4,000 spaces across the country, from places of worship, libraries, museums, to sports halls and community centres. Now, as someone who was involved from the outset when the idea was first conceived, I want to speak to you as you prepare for the coming winter. Last winter, Warm Welcome Spaces supported on average 120,000 visitors every week. And indeed, in our surveys of the first two years of operation, we found that over 50% of guests said that without the spaces, they would have been at home with the heating off and thus alone and in the cold. And they told us it wasn't just the physical warmth that made a difference. These spaces had a profound impact, reducing their isolation and loneliness. They offered not just the warmth of heating, but the warmth of friendship. That's why so many warm welcome spaces have now become all year round meeting places for people to talk, entertain each other and be entertained and to find friendships they never had before. And so what started as a palliative through the energy crisis has now become a national institution. Today, almost two out of every three people are within 30 minutes of a warm welcome space in their community. But that's not good enough. We have set ourselves a new mission for the next year to ensure that 100% of the population has access to a warm welcome space within walking distance. And to make our offer to welcome real, we will this year aim to ensure that instead of just one in five people knowing where to find their local space, all will have the chance to know what is on offer. As the famous writer Ian e. Foster said, in his book, Howard's End, only connect, live in fragments no longer. He was expressing before the worst world war, his fear about a widening gulf between people living side by side in the same communities who did not even connect with each other. Now we have a new way we can connect with each other, meet each other, talk to each other, learn from and help each other. A few weeks ago in July, during the height of summer, I spoke at a round table with representatives from electricity, utilities and other companies. And they were pledging the resources to ensure that warm welcome spaces can be properly heated and financially supported this winter. So now a growing coalition of partners representing the worlds of charity, faith, business, government and philanthropy are coming together in this unique way. To make this possible, we are creating nothing less than what I call a chain of hope. Warm welcome spaces in every community and neighbourhood linked to further spaces across the country, bringing people together and everyone has a role to play. You can all do something to help as supporters or partners, whether as the provider of spaces, the volunteer at the spaces or the funder of the spaces. And working together, we can drive out the worst of Britain by bringing out the best in Britain, unlocking the power of community and creating a more deeply connected society made by and for everyone. Join me in taking the warm welcome for all 100% pledge this winter and make every community a warmer, friendlier a more hopeful place. Well, so it was lovely to hear from Gordon and hear his inspirational message. And his support's been really important. He's been instrumental in um, really helping advocate for the um, movement, raise its profile and, and part of the way that we've opened doors to partnerships and funding. So we're very grateful for his ongoing and obviously very heartfelt support. And um, we're now going to hear from two amazing spaces from the horse's mouth, people on the front line of delivering spaces that are part of that chain of hope, as Gordon says. So firstly, I'd like to introduce Fran Etherington and her warm spaces at the old fire station in Leeds. So Fran, over to you. Good evening, everybody, and uh, thank you so much for inviting me to share 
information about our um, warm welcome space in Leeds. As Isabel says, um, I'm the development manager of the old fire station in an area of East Leeds called Gipton. Um, Gipton is one of the most deprived areas of Leeds. Um, in fact, it's one of the most deprived areas of the country. And to give you an idea of the sort of place that we're working in, um, it always I find it extraordinary that life expectancy for a man living in Gipton is only 75 years old, whereas in other areas of the city, um, uh, the same man would live to be 83 years old. And that's due to the different circumstances that people are living in, the challenges that they face, the kind of life they have. And I think that that's a really shocking thing in this day and age. 46% um, of the children in Gipton live in poverty, um, which again is a really shocking um, figure in, in, in the country that we live in. That That's something that is really extraordinary. And so you can see the sort of challenges that we're meeting in the area that we're working in. Um, we joined the Warm Welcome Space organisation and um, team, if you like. Um, right at the beginning, I, I felt that it was a really um, good way of explaining the work that we do, really. Um, it's so important to us to have those warm, welcoming spaces for people who are struggling with the cost of living crisis, struggling coming out of COVID at the time. And that sense of isolation and uh, loneliness was really overwhelming for a lot of people. So branding ourselves as a warm, welcome space was a really um, great thing to do. And it's been a really um, positive journey for us. Um, when we first started, we very much branded everything um, that we did as specific warm, welcome spaces, inviting to people to come along to do that. And we found really that changing that the in in following years was a good idea so that we removed any stigma for people coming along. It was just um, every activity we have, every space we offer is a warm welcome space and we work really hard to get that across. So instead of running specific events for things um, as a warm welcome space, we just brand everything that we do as that. So it's, that's been a really positive um, part of what we do. Um, we've been really lucky to work um, alongside one of the partners that Warm Welcome Spaces introduced us to through um, Sky Group. Um, their work has been just invaluable to us. And, and a specific example of that is a tea party that we ran in the summer, because it's really important to point out that these spaces are not just about winter spaces. Um, people need warm, welcoming spaces and a warm welcome at all times of year. So Sky ran a tea party with us in the summer, which was a hugely successful event. Um, there were people who came from the local community um, to have an afternoon tea with us. Um, exactly what it said on, on the tin, lots of cups of tea and cakes. We were able to put on an entertainer. They had um, a magician doing up close magic with them for the afternoon. It was really wonderful, really special things for people to see. Um, and we were able, because of the conversations we could have with people at that event, we were able to really um, talk to people about their needs. And there was a particular family there who we were then able to help further because they'd come to that event. So it was about them coming to the event, the conversations that we had, and just that really positive experience of being there. Thanks, Fran. That's amazing to hear. And it's... You know, it's extraordinary the, the sort of ways that a warm welcome can really reach people. And your story there about the family that you were able to help because you'd made that sort of kind and thoughtful connection with them. That's that's really um, lovely to hear. So much of it is about those conversations that people have. Yeah, the power of a cup of tea and a chat mm -hmm. is, uh, yeah, <laughs> never ceases to amaze me. Um, and now for our second space, um, I'd like to introduce um, Holly Kersis Hull, who is from Holy Trinity Church in Leytonstone in East London. Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for having us here. Uh, it's great to be amongst some incredible people um, sharing about their spaces and he hearing Fran's story. Um, I run a space with an incredible team at our church, Holy Trinity, um, called the Community Food Share. We have been running as a community food share for eight years, but we wanted to move from transactional to relational. 
Um, and we found that post COVID and the cost of living crisis, um, the need was so great. It, it had increased from about 25 users to um, we were serving between 60 and 80 households at peak. And now we're serving sometimes nearly 100 households. It was important for us to keep that relational culture, to meet people where they were, to learn their names, to know their stories. Um, and so we we built this team of volunteers who who their job really was to get to know the people that came through the door. Um, there's a lot of stigma attached to food related projects and in our community, 48% of children under the age of 18 live under the poverty line. And in my small patch um, where I am vicar is 0.4 of a square mile and yet I have nearly 14,000 people living here, many of whom are undocumented, so we don't really think that figure is correct. Um, people were coming through the doors and we were trying really hard to learn their names, welcome them back. And we met a, a young man called Jay. Now Jay um, started with us hood up, shoulders hunched, doing the weekly food shop for his mum. Gradually, he would stay a little bit longer and hover by the coffee stand, drinking a cup of tea. And then he'd stay a little bit longer too, and he'd say, can I help you? I'll move the pastries along, or I'll help that person show them where the toilet is, or I'll sit with them and have a chat. Jay is now one of our lead volunteers. Um, not only that, but he was able to be employed through an apprenticeship during the summer um, to serve on this team and to think about how we can be better at what we do. Um, that resulted in a food truck project where we now serve lunch and breakfast on the day that we're open. And he has created the menu from surplus foods, um, feeding a vegan menu to anyone who is walking past. He's gone from unemployed, um, 25 years old, not really coming out of the house much, now to being paid to lead a project in which it is feeding people, not just nourishing food, um, but it's able to give them a sense of hope and relationship and identity. And much of this is thanks to the connection that we've made with Warm Welcome. We've been able to offer more than just transactional, here's your weekly shop, but more, how are you? Sit with us, spend time with us. One thing that's been key for us is relationships and networks. We couldn't do this without networking with Warm Welcome and then establishing relationships with other key Warm Welcome spaces in our community. And through the power of organizing, we've been able to do some incredible things joining together. Um, and we had an action on a hotel that was due to remove asylum seekers and spread them across the country. Well, welcome spaces joining together, were able to keep those families in that location, the children in school and the, um, those in, staying in that hotel in employment shows the power of joining together as spaces and not acting in isolation. Great, thanks Polly. Those are two really powerful stories. Um, and I think I'm often struck when I hear stories about warm, welcome spaces. Uh, people come in um, who maybe need help, but then what they're given is that kind of dignity and respect of an opportunity to help others. Mm. And um, I think that's you know re really wonderful thing that so many people want to do that. They don't just want to be passive um, sort of victims of circumstance, if you like, but to have that opportunity to then turn that around and feel like they're contributing to. I think that's you know I think you, you, your story conveyed that so well. Thank you. Great. So thank you both, Fran and Polly. Um, and my sister's just told me she's a big fan of the old fire station. She she takes my um, elderly mum there and, and loves visiting. And, and yeah, mate, sounds like you do amazing stuff. So I'm sure she'll be in again before too long. So thank you. And now I'm going to hand over to David, who's going to introduce some of the corporate pledge partners. Thank you so much. And thanks, uh, Fran and Polly, for those wonderful stories. Really incredible to hear about the impact that you're having. Yeah, it's my pleasure now to introduce you to a few of our key uh, business partners. 
at Warm Welcome. And I'm going to be introducing them and asking them to just share a little bit about why they're involved in Warm Welcome and what that partnership might mean this winter. So first of all, it's an absolute pleasure to introduce Andy Button-Stevens, the head of the Barrett Foundation. Thank you, David, and good evening, everybody. Um, as David said, it's wonderful to hear those stories from the old fire station in Leeds and Holy Trinity in Leytonstone. My name is Andy Button-Stevens, and I have the privilege of leading the Barrett Foundation and overseeing Barrett's philanthropic work all across the UK. I first heard about the Warm Welcome Spaces almost a year ago, to this day, in fact, when the Warm Welcome team wrote a very compelling application to our first round of Barrett Foundation Grants Program. And I just love, and David used the phrase earlier today, that love that phrase that, that people come for the warmth and they stay for the welcome. And that sense of community that we all want to be a part of. And Polly's story of Jay, I mean, just incredible. Through the Barrett Foundation, uh, we are the dedicated charitable organization of Barrett Developments PLC, the UK's leading house builder. We invest four million pounds into charities and communities each year. And our vision is to help communities across the UK to thrive. The Warm Welcome Spaces aligns perfectly with our vision and our focus on communities, those most disadvantaged, poverty and social inclusion. Earlier this year, we made a significant donation to support the Warm Welcome Spaces, and we're really excited to be actively exploring further support for the pledge and a multi-year commitment to this vital campaign. We know that Barrett team members are so proud of the communities that they build and the communities that they create, and I'm excited to unlock further support from across Barrett and from Barrett team members, whether that's through our local community fund or, and ideally through lots of volunteering at their local warm welcome space. Thank you very much for letting me be a part today. Thank you so much, Andy. Brilliant to have you. Next, we're going to hear from Richard Alcock, who's the head of stakeholder engagement at National Grid. Thanks very much, David. And hello, everyone. Yes, I'm Richard Alcock. I work at National Grid Electricity Distribution. I'm head of engagement and uh, social obligations, and I look after our program of support for customers in vulnerable situations. As an um, electricity network operator, we provide the local energy network to our customers, but we also feel that we've got an important role to play in supporting the communities we serve to, particularly our customers in vulnerable situations. And that's why we're really proud to be working with David and the team at Warm Welcome to extend the reach of the support we're providing currently to our customers. We have over 2.4 million customers on what we call our priority services register. That's the register that um, is free to sign up for any customer that would struggle um, if they lost their power. And we're able to provide additional support and help to, to customers um, when that situation occurs. We've also got a network of established partners delivering one-on-one -on -one support to, um, to customers that were maybe struggling with their bills, struggling to heat their homes. We support over 20,000 customers a year through that program, right across our regions from down in the southwest in Cornwall, all the way across to the east coast in Lincolnshire. And what we're trying to do is extend the reach of that support by linking in with more of the grassroots organisations that are supporting their local communities. And we've seen a huge uptick in the number of these organisations um, post pandemic and during the, um, the energy crisis. And what we're trying to do is build additional layers into our programmes of support and additional pathways into that programme. And this is where Warm Welcome comes in because we see that as vital um, in supporting um, the activity that, that David and the team do in growing that network of spaces who help their communities. And we're able to offer both immediate and longer term support to people that are using those spaces through our established network of partners. We've already seen how this can work, actually, because last winter, our Community Matters Fund provided £2.7 million of funding to over 400 warm spaces in our region. And we had fantastic support from Warm Welcome um, for those spaces, giving advice and support um, throughout the winter. And throughout the winter, that had an estimated reach of over 180,000 people in our communities. And that was really the, the catalyst for our partnership with Warm Welcome. Hearing the, the case studies that came back from those um, um, organizations that were funded 
through um, through last winter and the really powerful stories was was so important uh, and just seeing the the impact that small grants can have relatively small grants can have on on organizations that are delivering really powerful support um, was was really um, really important to see. So our partnership with Warm Welcome Spaces, um, what we're looking to do is build on that network of spaces, um, helping them with, with additional funding to, to reach out to a, a wider network of spaces, provide training, provide training and support, um, champion spaces and, and referrals into, um, into um, further support for our customers by giving them um, pathways to energy advice and um, fuel poverty support. We're also looking to provide opportunities to our colleagues, actually, who are proud to serve the communities they work in and maybe want to um, volunteer in the spaces, too. So really looking forward to see the positive impacts that this collaborative approach can can deliver for our communities together with Warm Welcome. So thanks very much for um, having us here today. Thanks, David. Thank you so much, Richard. That's brilliant. Next, we're going to hear from David Luckin, who is the head of community fundraising and partnerships at the Cooperative Group. Thanks, David. Um, re really good to be on, on the launch event this evening. Um, and the first thing I want to say is that I'm just really proud that Co-op is supporting um, the Warm Welcome campaign's 100% pledge. Um, Warm Welcome have achieved a huge amount in a short time, and the, the campaign's focus on human connection as a, a key way to make a difference to well-being just chimes really strongly with us. So Co-op is a member-owned organisation. We've got more than 5.5 million members, uh, and we know that supporting their local communities is something that they're absolutely passionate about. We, we've got a range of ways in which we work to achieve this. Um, this includes funding for more than 40,000 community projects since 2016 through our local community fund. And, and many of these are just the sort of projects that are members of the Warm Welcome Network, the sort of projects that we've heard from this evening. We've also got a network of more than 100 colleagues based in communities across the country um, called Member Activators. Now, their role is all about driving participation in co-op membership, but also about making a difference to our members' communities and helping to connect our members and co-op colleagues in our stores and funeral homes across the country and our community partners at a local level. So we're going to be bringing together all of these assets uh, work with Warm Welcome and help support the 100% pledge. Um, we're going to be sharing our commitment to supporting Warm Welcome with our members. Um, and an email has gone out today to nearly 2 million members uh, with a link to the campaign site. We're, we're also going to be um, continuing to share opportunities for co-op funding um, with organisations that have signed up to being a Warm Welcome space. And then that network of colleagues around the country will be signposting the community groups, charities and community partners that we work with to warm welcome to help grow the network. So we, we hope that through this we'll, we'll be able to really support the individual projects that are out there in communities across the country, making a difference and ultimately support and connect people um, in communities across the country. Thanks very much. Wonderful. Thank you, David. And last but absolutely not least, um, we've got Claire Dupree, the Community Programme Manager at Sky. Thanks so much, David. So, um, yeah, I'm the Programme Manager for Sky's Time to Care programme that sits under our broader Sky Cares CSR initiative. And yeah, it's such a privilege to be in your company this evening and just to work alongside Warm Welcome as we kickstart our partnership working. Um, so at Time to Care at Sky, we're committed to trying to be a force for good in the communities where our people live and work and giving them a chance to give, giving our people a chance to give back and make a difference in a really meaningful way. And with that in mind, our, we don't have sort of a charity of the year model. We are cause driven. So we want to affect real and lasting change and do things a wee bit differently as a corporate partner for our charities. Um, that cause is quite ambitious. Our mission is to tackle loneliness and social isolation by making positive connections 
and really build an ongoing meaningful relationships. So although it's a big company and a national campaign, we have real local impact um, across our staff force. Um, we work with causes big and small, including some real grassroots organisations that really matter for our people um, and also for our customers. And it's where we can make a real big impact. The primary demographic for Time to Care is older people, but we do support a range of causes that, and projects and charities that are across age groups and from a variety of different backgrounds to just whatever there's need for that help um, in service of tackling loneliness. And what unites us with these partner organisations, including our partnership with Warm Welcome, is that shared objective that we all have for fostering community connection and lifting people out of loneliness. And we do that through our in-house guide befriending line, where we speak to about a thousand customers every week just for a friendship chat. Um, our community volunteering, um, our digital champion program, which helps bridge the digi divide and help get people connected to online world. Um, a community grant fund. So again, like you've heard from some of the other corporates, just given these grants, some quite small scale, right, but to help foster this community activity and fund some of these social groups. Um, and finally, through awareness reasons. So we do a lot of campaigning and team days to get get the conversation started, get people talking about loneliness, exactly what we're all joined here, um, joined forces here tonight to do, um, and the ways in which we can actually collectively really come together and make a difference and join this movement for change. So with that in mind, there is real clear synergy here between Time to Care at Sky Objectives and um, the brilliant work of Warm Welcome and the member groups. We're really delighted to already be supporting the team and some of the network with them, um, some volunteering and in-kind support and donations um, and collaborating on these events. Um, as you heard from Fran there with the tea parties in the summer and coming up some Christmas dinners and parties as well that we're going to be supporting um, with some of the member groups across the winter. Um, I'm really proud just to join the Warm Welcome Pledge just to help raise that awareness signpost our stakeholders and customers to the cause as well so people know what you're all about how we can access support and crucially how they can play their part um, and join that movement and just add that sky voice to the campaign um, where we can um, we see this as a real win-win collaboration and really delighted to be part of this community tonight as well so thank you very much for having us thank you claire and thank you massive thank you to all of our partners um, this evening, you've just seen a snapshot of the different kinds of organisations that get involved in Warm Welcome. And it's one of the things that I love most about Warm Welcome is that we get both the incredible depth of impact and the, the individual stories of people's lives who are transformed through engaging with Warm Welcome spaces. But we also have the scale of resources that we can bring to bear together to try and support that activity at scale across the whole of the country. And I just think that's a really unique opportunity. So thank you to all of our partners. We absolutely couldn't do what we try to do in terms of resourcing, connecting and championing warm welcome spaces without you. Great. I'm going to hand back to Isabel. We're going to have just a very brief uh, pause and then we're going to come to a panel discussion um, where you will get your chance to ask us some questions. So hang with us for just a few seconds and then we'll go straight into the panel. Great. Welcome back, everybody. And it's now time for our panel session. Um, so we've got some great questions that have come through in the uh, question box and please do keep typing them in there. Any questions we can't pick up this evening, we'll make sure we're answered in the um, FAQ sheets on our website. Um, so firstly, no surprise here, I think um, a few people are asking about funding. Um, so are there any um, special warm uh, welcome grants available this year or are there any other sources available or ways that the uh, warm welcome campaign can signpost people to funding? Um, so to answer that question, I'm going to invite um, Ellie Palmer, who's the director of fundraising at the Warm Welcome campaign. Ellie, have you got any uh, hints and tips in this area? Sure, absolutely, Isabel. Um, we knew this question would come up. Um, as Isabel said at the beginning, um, here we are. No one has any money and no one has any time. But this incredible thing is happening right across the country in spaces. And um, we hugely appreciate that we are fundraising in a really, really tough environment. There's that increased need an extra demand um, with the same or even less money available to fund your work. What I would say is a, that message to please do register with Warm Welcome. What we have um, 
behind um, the registration point is our a handbook for spaces that has a lot of tips on fundraising, some advice. Um, and please do join us in, in this movement that we've talked about this evening, because in that movement, we can bring that collective voice together and we can talk to partners, you know, people we've already heard from our friends this evening, where there is that um, connection to our work um, and um, that understanding and that commitment. And we are really striving, and really working incredibly hard to bring in more of those partners, to be having conversations in the business world, to be having conversations with statutory funders, philanthropists, um, and um, the more we can come together, the louder our voice is. I would say that also that um, I think we've seen this evening that in this really difficult funding environment, warm welcome spaces can really stand out from the crowd. In that spaces handbook that we talk about, there's some advice on gathering impact and data yourselves. Again, we get that you probably, you know, th there's a likelihood that you might not have time to do that for your space. Use us, become part of the warm welcome spaces network um, this movement, use the impact data that we have, which we know grabs attention, we know impresses people. It's that um, logical case for why funders should support your work. And then at the same time, those stories, which we know are in space, we've heard from Polly and Fran this evening, and those stories really do um, grab people's attention. It's the hearts element. And we know you've got lots of them. So do tell your stories do um, use us as much as possible and keep talking to us. We want to hear about your funding needs. And we want to keep those conversations going. Brilliant, thank you, Ellie. And uh, yeah, I just want to second that the um, sort of evaluation impact data that the um, warm welcome campaigns collated is, is really powerful. So yeah, absolutely great to use that sort of for local fundraising or, or, or for a small scale organisation, really, really powerful. So thank you. Um, so for the next question, I'd like to turn to um, Myra, who's the Director of Communications for uh, the Warm Welcome campaign. There's a few questions, Myra, about um, is uh, marketing collateral, branding, um, I'm just looking at the ones that are coming through. Um, so I don't know if you'd like to say a bit about how that might work and also a question about something we've we've talked about this evening, how activity is now running throughout the year, the warm welcome throughout the year. So um, is it possible to use collateral year round and not just for the cold, cold months of the year? Hi, um, hi, Isabel. Hello to everyone. Um, what brilliant questions. Yes, the brand is here for all year round. Um, those that are new to Warm Welcome, you won't know yet, but we've got a really, really um, broad brand toolkit. We've got about six different colours and what we've been doing is switching through the summer months to some of those brighter, more spring and summery colours and then using those kind of really warm, warm colours for winter. So there's lots of breadth within the brand. Everyone who registers with Warm Welcome will have access to our brilliant brand toolkit. And in there, there are lots of icons that you can use to illustrate your communications. And um, the th second thing I'd like to say is we have a communications toolkit. It's there for everyone, again, who registers. And inside that, you'll find some template messages, um, some social media messages, press releases, and um, lots of ideas about how you can promote your space locally. Um, it's really important, and I'm sure Fran and Polly would say this, is that you have to think about um, how you can access your local community and what they need to, to find out about you. And uh, you've talked about needing publicity um, um, leaflets and posters. You'll find on your dashboard when you register, there's lots of model ones that you can use. And um, if you are a whiz at um, some very, very simple design packages, there's a marvelous design package called Canva. It's free to use and you can create your own assets. If you get stuck, you can contact we're only too happy to help. Um, but just some top tips. And again, there are lots in the comms toolkit about how to make yourself visible. Um, think about signage outside your building and remember 
that your audience, the people that need you might not be online, they might be digitally excluded. So really, really think about how you can drive them to you, get your posters up in community centres, council buildings, GPs, health centres, supermarkets, pharmacies, food banks, anywhere where you think people might go that could really benefit from using your space. And as Ellie says, and I've, I've seen coming through on the chat, People are keen to share their stories tonight. We can't stress that um, enough. Every story that you send us, we will publish. We'll share that on our website, with our funders, through our social media. So keep those stories coming. Fantastic. Thanks, Mara. One quick question before I um, move on. And um, somebody's asked, will there be resources available in Welsh at any point? That's a very good question. Um, we will take that away and I'm hoping some of our lovely um, warm welcome spaces in Wales might give us a hand with that. We would love to do that. So let's take that conversation um, to our next warm welcome meeting. Brilliant. That's great. Thank you. Um, and, and I, I just want to pick up on something you were talking about there, uh, Myra, about thinking about your communications, how to think about the needs of different people and make it more inclusive. So I'd now like to bring in um, Emika Forbes-Hastings, who's the Warm Welcome Inclusion Lead, to talk about that. Because I think everyone running spaces is aware that there isn't such a thing as a community. Areas that people live in are made up of all sorts of individuals with all sorts of needs and aspirations, uh, so hidden vulnerabilities and so on. Um, so what, what tips have you got? How can spaces navigate that to make sure they're reaching as many people as they can and as broad a mix of people? Yeah, Isabel, absolutely right. There, there is no one community. It's a tapestry of lots of different communities. And I think the thing about warm welcome spaces, all the spaces in, in the network, of course, many of you uh, who are on this call, uh, the, the variety and diversity of spaces is already immense. We've got spaces, of course, in mosques and churches and libraries and sports centres and other kinds of community centres. So I think there is already a representation across the spaces in the network of that fantastic uh, diversity. Look, what I'd say in terms of reaching out to a wider audience, bringing people from a, a wide and diverse range of backgrounds into spaces, the first question to ask yourselves is who is that space likely to uh, attract? What do you know about people in your local community? There is no substitute here, frankly, for getting out and speaking to people, asking the questions, finding out uh, from people around you uh, what their needs are, what their backgrounds are, what kinds of space they, they would want to see and, and really understanding uh, within that what kinds of access needs might they have? Uh, where is your space going to be located? When is it open? Is it wheelchair accessible? Uh, is there public transport to get to your space? There are lots of considerations there. What I would encourage you to do, of course, we talked about the handbook, lots of here. Uh, it's, you, you're going to come away, all of you, thinking that it's the holy grail of information, and in some ways it is. Um, but there is so much in that handbook, really practical guidance and tips about inclusion as well. I would group it into three core categories, access, awareness and experience. So access, I talked about a little bit already. Uh, look, if you can think about locating your space in an area where there is not already a warm welcome space, if you can uh, liaise with other warm spaces in your community, have a look on our website, look on our map and find out where are their gaps uh, and consider what you can do to open spaces there. Opening hours are really important because again, uh, there'll be some people who might work during the day, some people who might have children who want to use spaces. So if you can think about how you can tailor your opening hours uh, around the needs of your community. Myra has talked already about some of the awareness sides of this. So don't forget that lots of people won't have access to the iPhones or the computers that we all have are joining these calls with. Uh, people might need to access information in different ways. So don't, don't underestimate the power of frankly word of mouth going out and talking to existing leaders in the community and asking if they can share the word good old-fashioned posters on notice boards it's still important still really uh, really relevant and of course uh, social media as well as an important uh, vector to, to reach people and the final thing i want to touch on here of not just getting people into spaces but also keeping them there experience what is the experience of visitors when they arrive in spaces do they see somebody who can welcome them into the space when they arrive there? Do they see materials uh, in their own languages? 
think about how people are going to be feeling as they enter spaces. You know, we we talk here, of course, warm welcome began and you know we saw that film of course from 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 gordon brown but warm welcome began as this collective endeavor to uh, to respond to a really pressing need during the real depths of the cost of living crisis and of course now a much bigger uh, a much more forward-looking movement as we build this network of spaces for people of all backgrounds to come together and and spend time and, and connect across differences but of course there will be people who come into spaces who've got specific vulnerabilities specific needs and so you need to be thinking about stigma is that something which you're doing everything you can to, to mitigate um think about the kinds of activities you run as well you know people don't want to come into spaces and just sit there and stare at the walls so think about are there specific kinds of activities you can run are there things that you can do which are culturally sensitive can you celebrate different cultures and people from different backgrounds in your spaces uh, these things are all incredibly important and, and again some of the basics i've mentioned things like wheelchair accessibility other basic things like prayer spaces these are all very simple things that you can do, which just create that broader sense that this is a space not just for one group of people, but it is a space for everybody and everybody is welcome. And that is the real fundamental principle of the Warm Welcome campaign. Back to you, Isabel. Brilliant, that's fantastic. And I think hearing from both Polly and Fran, we really heard that, you know, how they've both put that, that kind of thinking into action and that the powerful results it's having. I wonder Mick, if you could also um, say a little bit about volunteers. So I think we've heard today again from Polly and Fran that um, sometimes people come in uh, to use the space but then are so inspired they want to volunteer and find a purpose through that. But there's a comment here from someone, really thoughtful comment saying um, we find getting volunteers difficult, there are lots of people willing but are unable for various reasons um, and sometimes it's too much looking after the volunteers so we can't actually then uh, provide um, the service for the wider community. So this person is asking are there any good practice examples or guidance or training available for sourcing volunteers and how to manage them effectively? Yeah, absolutely. Look, I, I think I think that's a, that's a really, really um, uh, relevant and pertinent question. Um, I think the way that we often talk, and certainly about in inclusion here, we, we often think in terms of how can we critically think about power and about power relationships. And I've said already, it's so important that the way that we create spaces, the whole essence and fundamental principle of the Warm Welcome campaign is that these are spaces for everybody. And we want to make sure that within those spaces, uh, people feel a real sense of, of agency. We don't want a sort of us and them dynamic to develop. So having that, uh, that, that sort of interplay between people who perhaps come and use the space, but then perhaps themselves want to volunteer and have a role in, in administering that space and supporting other people, I think is really, really powerful and really fantastic and something to be encouraged where you can do it. Of course, we get that, you know, of course, there will always be capacity challenges and, you know, managing volunteers is, is really challenging. And, and if you are on a small staff team, it can be difficult. There are some resources in our handbook, and I think there are some wider blogs that we've put out as well. Um, but look, there was a key principle here, which is give people the ability to have flexibility. Let them come in. If people want to give an hour here, an hour there, uh, there's no one model of volunteering. It could be that someone wants to volunteer to uh, to coordinate your communications and help you post on social media. It could be that somebody wants to be, that's the point I made before, who's doing the welcoming when someone comes into the space? Someone might want to just do that and that could be their volunteering role. Uh, and so whilst I get it could be challenging to manage and, and find that capacity, it really, really does pay off if you can do it. And, and it multiplies the investment that you, you put into it and multiplies tenfold. Lovely, that's that's great advice. Um, so we're nearly at the end of the panel session, so I'm going to bring David uh, back into the spotlight. And David, I've got, I think, three really quick fire questions for you. Um, so firstly, if you register, are you then committed? Obviously, as many small spaces can't always know if they can do it for the whole whole season. If you register, you have a choice as to whether you appear live on our map or not, and you can change that at any time. So you can register, be part of the movement, when you're ready to be live on the map and public about when your space is open and what you're offering, you can do that. But if you decide to just have a go this winter uh, and then see how that goes, you need to the, and you need to then pause, you can pause yourself on the map. So it's absolutely up to the spaces to decide how they want to do that. Brilliant. And of course, every, every little helps. So even if you only can run it for, you know, a couple of weeks, 
that still helps. It's great. Um, so second quick fire question. Um, have you got an idea of what days are the best if you can only run a part time space? Are there any days of the week? That... <laughs> I, I think it all depends on what's already available locally. So check the map, have a look at other spaces near you and when they might be open. We do notice that lots of spaces tend to be open more during weekdays. So actually something on the weekend might be particularly active, but it's got to work for you and for your volunteers as well as for people using the space. So there isn't a simple answer to that question, but see what's happening around you nearby. Great, and then third quick question about joining as a large network. So I think there was a question from someone from a, a, a local authority that has over a hundred welcoming spaces. So mm. can a large network join or does each individual space have to join? We love working with networks, local networks, thematic networks, as you represent, uh, Isabel. And we have a special group actually within the Warm Welcome campaign um, to support local authorities and others who are running local networks of spaces. So we'd love to engage you in that group. Um, if you send us an email, info at warmwelcome.uk, we can pick that up and get back to you. But we do try and encourage uh, those kind of networks to spread the word to the local groups for them to individually register. And the reason for that is those groups are then responsible for their information on the map. They can keep that up to date. And they also then get access to all of the things that we've talked about, including those up to date funding opportunities in the newsletter and on the website. Brilliant. And one bonus final Quick fire question. Do you need to register afresh every year? No, if you registered with us last year, you should still be registered. You can uh, log in on our website um, and uh, update your information. That's a really important thing for people to do as we come into the colder months. That's brilliant, thank you. And now David, it's over to you to talk about what next? Yes, thank you. Well, we're coming towards the end of our time. Really grateful for you all being with us. We've mentioned a couple of times this idea of the warm welcome for all 100% pledge. And this comes from a piece of research we did with UCL University that found that 62% of the UK population currently live within a 30 minute walk of a registered warm welcome space, which is a brilliant achievement, but we are not stopping there. And we also know from that research that just 18% of people know exactly where the nearest warm welcome space is. So the 100% pledge is our way of encouraging everybody to signal that we want to work together to drive up those numbers of people who have access to a space, who know about a space, up to as close to 100% as possible. But that's going to require all of us. And you can help, of course, by registering and encouraging other spaces to register, by spreading the word about Warm Welcome through your networks this winter. And you can make your pledge on our website. Um, hopefully the particular address will be going up on the chat as I speak. Um, and then when you make that pledge, you'll get a special campaign pack to help you share the news about your pledge. And so just before we finish, we've got a short video of some friends and partners who have already made the pledge. Last winter, Warm Welcome Spaces hosted more than 120,000 visits every single week. Warm welcome spaces are places of connection, fueled by human warmth and buzzing with life. Places where new friendships are forged and where people are seen and valued. 62% of the UK population currently live within a 30 minute walk of a registered warm welcome space. A great achievement, but we're not stopping there. That's why we're asking everyone to join our 100% warm welcome for all pledge to make sure that everyone can find a place of warmth and welcome just around the corner. We are making a 100% pledge. Warm welcome, welcome for all. This winter, we're pledging for as many mosques and Muslim community spaces to sign up to be a warm welcome space. Our pledge is to provide a space for all and in partnership with Warm Welcome to strengthen our collective voice. We'll make sure that every Together Coalition partner is aware and supporting of the campaign and we'll make sure that as many community spaces as we can register. Everyone deserves to have access to warm, welcome spaces and that's why we're thrilled to be a partner and hope to be able to support warm, welcome spaces across the country this year. And to do this, we're going to be working with Warm Welcome Centrally to strengthen our collective voice and shout from the rooftops to all community groups to sign up so that people can find and access Warm Welcome spaces across the UK. We'd love to encourage you to be part of this initiative. It's making a difference in the nation. And by signing up, 
you'll make a difference for some of the most vulnerable, lonely, isolated individuals in our communities. Social isolation and loneliness can utterly destroy people's lives. I'm making a pledge for warm welcome today because I believe in that bold ambition to provide a place of belonging and reconnection for everyone in the UK at a warm welcome space near their home. We have a vision where every warm welcome space is accessible and inclusive to all, where people of all cultures, backgrounds, faiths and from all walks of life can come together in their communities. Take the pledge and join us in helping us make this vision a reality. Join me by making your 100% pledge. Together we can make our country full of warm welcomes for everybody. Head to warmwelcome.uk to find out more. We'd love you to join us. Oh, I love that film. It's so inspiring. So I hope it's also inspired you to uh, join the pledge and um, help us grow this movement and deliver even more together. So I've just got a couple of seconds to say thank you to everyone involved in this evening. So that's Fran, Polly, Andrew, Richard, David Luckin, Claire, and of course, all the wonderful, wonderful people from the warm welcome team. But most of all, I just want to say thank you to all of you for coming along and, and thank you for the work that you do in your spaces in the winter and throughout the year and the differences you make to people's people's lives. It's, you know, it's extraordinary what you deliver and really meaningful. So thank you for coming along today. And um, I look forward to uh, seeing some of the stories coming out of your warm spaces over the next few months. Thank you.